Uh, my name is Jun Ping Du. Um, today's my topic is break down a new data silos in um, generative AI. Uh, this is about me. I'm founder and CEO of Destrado. It's a company. Uh, it, sorry, um, it's a company uh, founded by three Apache members. Uh, two is Hadoop Committer. The other one is Spark Committer. Um, and have before before founding the company. Um, uh, I have uh, more than 15 years in working in the data and uh, open source um, uh, industry. I'm ex chairperson for RFE and data. I'm also previously working for Horton with Cloudera and you know look like a Hadoop guys. I also uh, committed a PMC for many Apache projects, and also I'm you know mentor for a lot of data and AI open source projects. Um, okay, so f um, let me do a quick survey. Does anyone know? Uh, Alpha AI and Data Foundation. Um, can you raise your hand? Okay, several of them. Uh, so definitely, the Alpha AI and da uh, Data Foundation is previously when it's founded, it's not called Alpha AI and Data. It it uh, is once to call uh, Alpha Deep Learning, and then we changed the name to from Deep Learning to AI to be more generic. And in twenty uh, in uh, in twenty twenty. We changed to RF AI and data with the merging of ODPI that was uh, open source, you know, data foundation stuff. So basically, from the name or change from of the RF AI and data, you can see, um, you know, data and actually AI is actually uh, binding together. It's just like uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, just like Jim uh, mentioned in the uh, in the morning, uh, actually, the model is a AI AS model. I think we have the same perspective. Um, now, of course, uh, everybody is talking about generative AI, but um, this is a very uh, exciting time when we have to do a lot of uh, interesting innovations here. Uh, so basically, building on the super powerful foundation model, uh, we're building an eco, uh, ecosystem form of uh, different kind of software layers, tools. Uh, and eventually, other than uh, ChatGPT, yeah, ChatGPT oh, definitely is a disruptive application, but we'll see a lot of new application here um, in the coming, uh, in the next few years. But the thing, uh, the interesting thing is the key um, user experience of from this wave of new application will not be the same as the, uh, the old time like internet, like mobile computing at that time. Uh, the thing that's important is the UI, uh, how fancy UI it is, how much, how many functionality it is, or you know, about the performance. But you know, if you look at the chat GPT, it's you know, from a functionality or the UI perspective, it doesn't differ too much with you know other chat you know chatbot. Uh, there's a thousand or even you know tens of thousand chatbot. But what make um, um, ChatGPT uniqueness is something you know deeper. Uh, that's actually the model and uh, the data. Definitely, yeah, data is under the water. About um, uh, the quantity and quality of data uh, is really. Uh, without how much, uh, how much efficient, how smart your model uh, currently it is. So speaking back to our data, because data is so important. So when, when we look at the data, um, we will see the data is increasing you know, year over year, continue increasing. Uh, one of the top uh, drivers behind of the data increasing because it is because um, the applications. Right, uh, about 20, 30 years, we have internet and we have social media. We have, uh, inter uh, we have you know mobile computing. Uh, we have Internet of Things. Um, we have a metaverse now. We have generative AI. All all of these applications are uh, driving the data is increasing more and more. Um, and then, no matter you know how this different the volume of different or different type of the data, I think there's some uh, first principles for data. That is, the data has a gravity. Uh, it means um, it means a lot, right? Uh, but the most important thing I summarize here is it has to stay um, where uh, it's being uh, created, and also it's hard to discover when once it gets buried, right? And also it's uh, costly to move back and forth, so it's easy to get um, you know data siloed in some way. Um, Data silo problem is not a new problem, actually. Uh, it's already, you know, over 30 years, um, over 30 years ago, we started to do the on silo data. When at that time, they only have structured data, they only have the database, um, you know, applications. 
uh, at that time, we threw the ETL to make sure all the uh, you know, DB database are merged into a, a data warehousing, to providing a data mart to you know, application to, serve, to consuming. Uh, so that's the way, 30 year, um, over 30 years, how we break the data silos. But the things, it's changed after you know, the internet of things are rising. Uh, there's a lot of, a huge amount of data is coming in, and a lot of uh, unstructured data or semi-structured data uh, it makes the data warehousing solution or is not uh, effective and not efficient. So then we, in, we invent something new like uh, data lake. The data lake technology is a uh, conformal like Hadoop and also something like uh, S3. It can cheap, you can store, uh, store the data in the uh, process of data in a very cheap way. The good news is it, you can, you, have, um, you find a solution uh, to store your data, you know, together in a very cheap way. Other uh, bad news is uh, there's no single source of truth anymore because, you know, no matter what kind of engine you choose, you just uh, handle or process uh, only part of uh, your data, but not the data single, uh, the truth of the whole, all the things, all the pages. Um, in the year about 2020, uh, something new is innovated as the lake has tried to combine what we have in data warehousing uh, we have in the data lake. It's doing a good job, you know, to make sure uh, the, all the data can merge it in together and also we have some um, into a same uh, standard table format um, to be processed by, you know, you know multiple engines. Uh, but still, there are a lot of uh, new silos uh, today we, we're facing that lake house is not helpful. Um, just like uh, previously, a lot of um, infrastructure as is moving from on-premise um, data center to the cloud. Today, it's a lot of enterprise, a lot of companies actually choosing um, the multi-cloud um, as, as their strategy. The strategy is not only for, uh, because get rid of the vendor locking, uh, not only the technical perspective, um, and also maybe business perspective. And also there are a lot of cases that the company has to, uh, you know, using multi-cloud, uh, including uh, if the company want to expand their business to internationally, they have to choose in something global cloud vendors instead of local vendors. And also there's some M&A case. Once a company acquire a new company, um, then they, they may choose a different cloud vendors. They have to deal with uh, this complexity. Uh, but what's the problem? The problem is uh, if uh, applications stay in the multi-cloud, then the data has to stay in the uh, you know, multi-cloud. Just like I said, the data has a gravity, right? But um, this kind of cloud stack, uh, data stack in the different cloud, actually they cannot, they not work with, uh, with uh, each other very well uh, to make this data, uh, data get siloed uh, in this multi-cloud. And also some third party tools, um, they also had a si uh, silo problem, just like you know, Snowflake and Databricks, they cannot um, you, you don't, you don't, you, you won't, you won't expect in the, uh, you query some data from the uh, Databricks to a Snowflake in a very efficient and uh, quickly way. Um, and also this is true for hybrid cloud uh, cases. Uh, a lot of cases will bring um, data silos. If I look at uh, the picture a little bigger, um, not only multi-cloud, but also the multi-region, the things will be even worse and complicated. Uh, because rather than you know physical distance, rather than uh, technical uh, silos, we also have to take care to think about the compliance, the compliance problem. Because a lot of regions they have their own policy, you know how to manage your data, how to govern your data, how to process your data. So that's a different. Um, that's why uh, Lake House is not enough uh, to handle the today's challenge for um, data silo problem, uh, because it's hardly you know, impossible to unify all the data in this situ situation into one place um, for cost, for performance, for regulation problem. Um, for all these reasons, it's, it cannot. Um, if we step back and we think what we want to do uh, to handle, they actually, um, in this situation, I mean, multi-cloud, multi-region, um, on distributed data lakes, is end up with a dispute, uh, distributed and data lake situation. Uh, if you look at the situation, the co most uh, company actually need is a, it's a centralized place to govern your data. And you can put your analysis workload, no matter your data from you know, which, uh, which cloud, which 
or regions, you want to just want to analysis your job, right? Or training your data. Uh, this is what you want. So basically, we want if we stood back, we will try to building something um, really innovative thing is we call it a data stratosphere. That's uh, um, we have we're building a, a cross cloud layer of data fabric so that you can take care of all your metadata. And also we have uh, built something like a, a federal query engine to allow you the query can work with different uh, heterogeneous um, uh, data warehouse things that make your analytics work uh, efficient and effective. And also uh, for data security and the global acceleration part, uh, we like to providing a simple solution that you can apply uh, easily in one site and you know apply it to uh, globally yeah and also as a next generation of um, da data infer so uh, you need to providing single source of truth for metadata is also provide a smart governance you don't have to care about regulation problem and also uh, some uh, security problem here and it, you, it's better to have a natural language interface so that uh, data scientists uh, team, you don't have to involve all the efforts uh, to writing complicated C codes. Um, it also has, you know, dealing with the uh, ETL uh, workload today. So today, a lot of so many efforts and so many costs is spent on the ETL uh, for the data preparation or data pipeline. Um, that is because this is because um, yeah, we we through the traditional data warehousing way, we try to prepare all the you know, data into merge into uh, the single place. If we release the constraints, just like we mentioned, we don't have to you know, maintain a very costly uh, ETL across the different kind of moving data back and forth. So uh, let's talk in more details. So first thing first, um, there's a single source of choice for metadata. So metadata is uh, so important because it's a uh, data about data. Uh, instead of the centralized uh, data, uh, just like I mentioned, it's very uh, costly and it's maybe it's in most cases even impossible. Um, we actually uh, want to centralize some metadata. Uh, this is to solve a problem in how to govern um, the data in the centralized way, how to secure data in the one place, and how to achieve the single source of truth. Um, so we have a metadata lake. You can, no matter it's a, a data warehouse, data uh, lake, or it's a data warehousing, or it's a um, the SQL database, or its uh, Kafka topics, or even the AM models, uh, we can have a unified uh, uh, metadata lake. So that's an important thing. Once ha we have metadata um, centralized, that's something like we have uh, intelligent. Can, we have the intelligent built on top of it. Um, this intelligence is super important. In just the previous, just like previous years, uh, the people like you know Ferrari. Lamborghini because the engines, uh, you know, the engines are fast. We want to drive in very fast, but but nowadays or even in the future, people more care about you know how can we do the autopilot to make the you know drive through safely and saving my time and saving my efforts. Um, I think the data platform is also the same case as previous. Uh, people want care about you know how much time you know do the ad hoc query or do the ETL workload, but in the future. Um, we should pay more uh, extra attention on how much you know less effort for this uh, engineering work. You know, they can saving uh, their time to building the ETL pipeline. They can saving the data scientist uh, teams work to building um, the, the SQLs or the uh, scripts. I think uh, that is uh, why we bring uh, intelligent uh, to the data. Uh, we will show a quick demo. Uh, I will introduce my uh, my colleague uh, Lisa. Um, uh, the product manager of the Strato to continue to show the demo. Thank you. Uh, my mic is on. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, there's some really exciting stuff that that's going on here, and so I'm I'm very excited to be able to present this demo for everybody. So we talked a lot about data silos before, and so within an organizational context, how can we actually see that played out, especially across different departments? And we want to demonstrate a scenario here where we have, let's say, an HR and sales department that are running different databases. How can we actually you know, effectively query them in a way that 
you know, doesn't necessarily have this huge technical debt of having to build out a ton of ETL beforehand. And then how can we, you know, platformize this in a way where analysts can very easily query it using a natural language interface? So we're going to be going over a little bit about what might that look like. And let's see. I'm going to play this video here. Welcome to the Gratino UI. Here we have a default meta lake, and that meta lake contains two catalogs, a Snowflake catalog, which contains a sales database. And this sales database has the typical tables that you would find in this sort of database. We also have a Postgres database. And this has a HR database. And again, this contains the sort of tables you would expect in that database dealing with employees. In this demo of Gravitino, you can see on the left hand side that we have some multi-cloud metadata that is stored in Gravitino. We have a Snowflake database which contains HR information, so that's information about employees. And in AWS we have a Postgres database and this contains data about sales. First off, we're going to make a query from the sales <coughs> database. And this is just a, a, a simple query to find the top 10 employees with the highest sales. We can describe the query in natural language and the SQL will be automatically generated for us. The system understands the structure of the data and can infer relationships between tables based on the names of fields, as well as generating the SQL, we can also generate an explanation of the SQL. We can then just run the query and have the results returned. The next query we will perform is a multi-cloud query. We're going to look up the employee's average performance rating and what their total sales is. To do this, we need both the employee information from the Snowflake database and the sales information from the Postgres database. Again, we'll use natural language to generate the SQL and run the SQL. And the results are returned. Along with the results, we can also see a physical execution plan. And this shows where the data is coming from, from each cloud provider, and shows you where the data is joined together. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching that demo. Welcome with us. to the Gravitino Whoops. UI. Here and we have it. Not again. Only one time is good enough for us. <laughs> I wanted to get into the demo architecture and kind of decipher a little bit what we saw just now, because we talked a lot about that data plane and creating that layer, but what you saw right now was just an LLP, NLP prompt uh, that queried that. So the back end of that was Data Stratos, a project called Gravitino, which is open sourced as of today. And with that, we had two JDBC catalogs, one for Snowflake uh, and a Snowflake database, and another one for Postgres. And then on top of that, we saw underneath was a federated query engine that unified everything together, which was then used by a technology called Y as our front end there uh, to actually be able to query on top of that. And so with this, we're able to use the metadata like really effectively to, and then use a text to SQL translation to be able to query it and then to be able to join really efficiently despite being a multi-cloud environment. So in this case, we're really skipping so much in terms of having these SQL scripts and doing this really laborious work of building an ETL pipeline. And we're, in a, we're actually able to enable like data discoverability here and, and exploration in a really fun way that's accessible across organizations. So a lot of the magic that we have here is within the actual metadata itself. And the way that this works is that the Meta Lake service that you have is going to help build that data fabric that sits across your entire organization. Now we showed you know, within one organization two different departments, but thinking about you know, multi-cloud environments, thinking about cross-region environments, there's a lot in terms of scale that this could build out to. So right now with Gravitino, people 
you know, with authorization can have a global view on what would otherwise be really fragmented data. And so just like the demo that you saw, you can leverage this and then empower people across your organization in a really fun and exploratory way. So a big reason why we've decided to open source, I'm sure you saw JP's background, and really what we're built on is open source as sort of our core. And something like this is inherently going to have to need a lot of co-invention with the community. So we want to really work with people as we're still you know, building out this product instead of offering something that's super developed and maybe has no use case out in you know, the, the real world. We want to build technologies and features and, and connectors that people are using right now. And we want to be really collaborative within that process. We are taking the open source community extremely seriously. And we want people to, to have fun with us. We want people to be able to reach out to us and have casual questions. If they're having install issues. We want to be right there. And we have gone through incredible stakes to be able to have community managers around and to create discourse platforms for people to engage with. And we also want to build out an open standard. Uh, we want people to be able to not have to worry about interoperability. And to, again, this is the whole point of this technology, is to unsilo the data and to avoid these vendor lock-ins and these silos that do tend to build out. If you're really interested in Gravitino, which is the back end that you know, all of this sits upon, uh, we do have a QR code that takes you directly to our repo. Give it a star. Uh, if you're interested and you know, watch our development, create issues, engage with us, we're more than happy to work with people and to, to really make sure that it's open, right? That's really where we're, we're coming from. So a little bit more about Gravitino in terms of what a unified metadata like even is. Uh, we really want something that's agnostic between so many different database technologies. And so whether or not you're working with data lakes or data warehouses, you know, document or files, <coughs> uh, Kafka topics uh, or models, uh, we want people to be able to have critical features that would otherwise be a really large amount of technical debt in an organization, such as a single source of truth. And also included with that are you know, data and AI catalog services. Having a geo-distributed architecture in mind that can scale to, to an enterprise level really well, and then really have a combination of on-site catalogs and off-site data governance. So we want people to be able to secure their data and have a very solid idea of what is secured. I think as we know, maybe software supply chain is very you know, well developed these days, and as we're moving into this discussion of what is a data supply chain, how can we then even step forward even past that and secure things all in one go at this one step that everybody kind of understands to be this common source of truth? And I think this is where a lot of headaches lie within organizations. So this is our architecture. Uh, there's four main components to this, but I really want people to kind of look at the object model. and. Really what we've done is you know, have these different layers that we want to continually iterate on and, and to support more and more. And I hope that you know, in a year's time, this is just horizontally built out like crazy. And there's just a, an endless amount of things that we support. But really, we wanted to create a core object model that's generic enough to be compatible with a lot of different types of catalogs and to be able to connect to data warehouses, to documents and files on your message queues, and then on top of that, have the interface layer that then provides a RESTful, Thrift, or, or JDBC interface to then be used for other catalog services as well, and something that's standardized, something that people are already using in their stack and then to add on this layer of functional data governance and to provide you know, uh, ACL and optimization, lineage, and, and all of these different possibilities that can stem from having a solid and trusted metadata layer. And the possibilities are, are so endless there as well. So we went through a lot of different types of design choices, especially for Gravitino, I think that with with a project this ambitious. There's so many different architectures that you can run through and finding the right one was really hard. So again, we wanted to keep in mind this forefront goal of single source of truth, especially in terms of your metadata context. And so again, looking at the flexible object model, which was you know, really wanting to be suitable for all different kinds, types of data, just because complexity has really grown so much in this space in terms of what's possible and in terms of machine learning. And we want this to be pluggable with different types of catalogs. 
So the second thing that we also wanted to look at was to, instead of gathering all this metadata into one place that would, again, just be more processing and more storage, we wanted to use a direct managing mode. And we wanted to manage the underlying data sources to get rid of these consistency issues. The third thing that we wanted to look at was building a geo-distributed architecture, especially for cross-region joins, which can be really difficult. And we wanted to get this easily deployed. And so in different regions, in different clouds, you would feel really supported. And like all of your organizations, were having one single source of truth. And each catalog request is routed to a, a location that fits best and to, to get rid of fragmentation as a byproduct of this. So the fourth thing that we wanted to do as a part of this is to support multi-engines. And so a lot of our developers have you know, really core backgrounds in Hadoop and, and Hive. And so we wanted to also look at Spark as well, which uh, a lot of us have really strong backgrounds in, and also realize that we wanted to be agnostic towards engines in some way and to create this ultimate flexibility. And so Gravitino supports multiple engines such as Trino, Spark, and Postgres. And we hope to add more and more onto that regardless of whether or not it's open source or commercial. Again, we're really looking at interoperability and I think that's what causes this to work at the end of the day. And last but not least, we wanted to enable security in a really standardized you know, single source way where all of your data governance can be done like in this one single plane, right? So, we looked at the Gravitino UI in the demo, but we didn't necessarily look at it from the command line. And I'm sure a few of us are curious what it looks like in terms of usage from the command line. And so we wanted to create a metadata catalog and a metadata lake in this case, where the schema and the table can also be attached to it really easily. In a typical case, a company would have one meta lake to you know, encompass everything in their data, and then they can create the catalog underneath it. And usually you can have different business groups with different catalogs, and so we wanted to introduce that sort of flexibility and you know, with different schemas under that as well. So once you set up everything, you can query your table uh, with a catalog extension and then bind it to the execution engine. And let's say it's Spark in this case, and then apply a job configuration to different catalog services. So you know, one thing worth mentioning here is that this is a RESTful catalog. And so it's really convenient to access and integrate this into, you know, another, you know, service if you wanted to compared to like say, a JDBC catalog. So going through these steps, you can see that we're creating the metadata lake, we're creating the catalog under the metadata lake, and then we're creating the table and using Spark to then query it. And it can be really nice and easy to, to do this in an intuitive way without having to, to learn too much more ahead of time. These are some of the milestones that we're really looking at uh, into the future. So at December 2023, you're looking at today where we've released 0 0.3 uh, of Gravitino, which is now supported by multi-engine adoption uh, and also metadata operations as well, Iceberg catalogs if you've used Iceberg before, and we've open sourced that. And we want people to be really involved in this process while we're developing it. We're willing to do all of the hard work with implementation, but we want to know where people are at and we want to be able to support data engineers across different organizations, especially in enterprise, as much as possible. And in March 2024, you can expect to see our beta release, which includes the access control layer, security and hetero catalogs as well. And we also have our general availability release happening in June, uh, which will be production ready and compliant in so many ways, and then HMS drop-in replacements as well. So we're really looking forward to seeing how this scales and how this grows within the next year. Our team is working incredibly hard uh, and really does believe in this vision so much, and we want to get continuous feedback as part of that process. So this is our vision for the future. Um, and really what we're looking at is as everybody moves into like multi-cloud native architectures, and this might not be everybody, but it might be a lot of folks who find themselves in messy data situations, we want to be able to implement single sources of truth in terms of metadata and have this be really a, a way that can be leveraged and utilized by so many different parts of like let's say whether it's data ops or data engineering or machine learning uh, to be able to be managed in, in a way that is leveraged. And to also 
you know, maybe not completely get rid of ETL, but to simplify it in such a way that makes data so accessible across different organizations and to make data playful again and not have to deal with all of this, you know, under the hood infrastructure just to get one single query that maybe we realized we didn't need after all and to have something a little bit easier to work with and flexible. And again, we want to, to pair with platform engineers and we want to develop a platform where people can bring their insights into this data and to have that data itself be intelligent and to be really easy to work with. And you saw that with our, our code demonstration with why. So again, uh, hopefully everybody enjoys this cute little uh, picture here. I really love it. And we are hiring currently. So if you're interested, email hr at datastrato.com or visit our website at datastrato.ai. And you can go to our career section. And thank you so much. I know that the end here is near. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. If any questions. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, the, there's a lot of uh, related optimization related to the partition stuff. So we think the partition, this kind of information, is belong actually not data. It's actually uh, metadata. So we were having some metadata um, describing on the partition details I'm sorry, into. I'm not referring to partition. Cartition. Yeah. Partition. Okay. Cartition. How how like based on how the data store? It could be one to many or one to one among the attribution, yeah. Yeah. and how the query optimizer can provide the better query uh, that you can use it when the data is present. Yeah, the thing is, we think um, today is a lot of you know optimization for a query engine is actually uh, the building this optimization, you know, um, you know this, uh, the data, metadata mixed with the engines, it's, a, uh, it's too tightly, we were think it's too tightly. So that means um, one engine, if you store, you know, if you store data into one engine, uh, it will be very hard for other engine or other uh, compute uh, engine to consume because you build a lot of, you, you, a lot of you know, shortcuts or tricky things there. So what do we think? We should, we should move in this kind, all this kind of optimization uh, and also the metadata part out of the engines so that this part can be shared by the multi engines, definitely we want the multi engines because you know in the you know multiple cloud situ uh, scenario situations, um, this this no one engine fund can fit for all. So we definitely uh, case by case we want to move some of the, this kind of information to out of uh, the previously uh, engine data engine part. Yeah, but th but then don't you think you'll have a performance challenges? You are uh, deferring it to the later state because when you have a queries coming in from natural language, the yeah. demo what you guys have shown, yeah. uh, it may not be optimal query. Yeah. Again, you just need to figure it out on how do you optimize the queries. Yeah. yeah so that's a good question. So firstly, this is uh, SQL translation um, efficient, right? And second thing is rather than comparing with the ETL, the ETL is already do a lot of work ahead, and now is we change update to an ad hoc query, and this will be lower performance as well. Uh, but this is only for today, for now. If for the future, if you think you know, we still maintain some um, uh, ETL pipeline for just for some high frequent um, data you know uh, requirement. But for some ad hoc query, just like uh, business leaders or CXO. Uh, they have some ideas and want to ask some questions, uh, or everyone, or everyone can have. Uh, you know, this is for this is infrequent uh, data access requirement, and that will be our the power of the demo where shows. And also, there are a lot of uh, um, there are a lot of uh, potential uh, optimization we can do, uh, no matter from the SQL translate perspective or um, the way we execute a uh, physical plan. So the actual physical plan. If we ha we have noticed a lot of um, you know operators uh, operations just like we merge the you know um, the ta ta the data from different cloud into the same places we notice uh, some tables uh, it's 
consumed or is used a lot, then we can automatically build in some kind of cache and index, just like we said. We have a, a data stratosphere layer across it. This is, we can put it on the view, uh, uh, even a materialized view to accelerate, uh, accelerating it. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> is the join happening on your side where you're bringing the data in <coughs> and then joining it on your side, which means you've brought the data over the wire? to be able to join? Oh no, the thing is not. Actually the Y is only taking care of the, uh, from, the uh, from the input of the la uh, languages and how to generate a SQL. When the generator SQL is pushed to us and we have a federated query engine uh, to make sure, it, uh, to you know, just like show that the, what create a physical plan, uh, how to execute it. Uh, there actually it's a way to execute it. So you execute it, and you have to somehow combine all the yeah. uh, answers together to then bring back a single answer yeah, across and source. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. We um, rather than you know pulling the data from a lot of places, we are do the you know some operator push down uh, to push different cloud engines. That's why we call it a federated query engine because it works with different engines uh, under the bottom. So. So that's what be uh, the most effic uh, efficient way and the most fast way to do that, to do so. Yeah. Okay. Hey, uh, I had a question. So for your metadata, like, are you, we can use anything, like Oracle or SQL Server or anything? Yeah, it's mostly uh, can adding a lot of things. Uh, just like you said, Oracle, um, uh, MySQL. Yeah, so f from the beginning, we're adding the post, you know, Postgres. So this is well tested. But for the MySQL, for the Oracle, uh, because we are open source project, right? And uh, we will deliver, and also a community member will deliver to it. And eventually, we will support uh, most of them. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you all for the questions. Thanks. Thank you.